I start the welcome? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And sir? Uh, please, sir. Please, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. அனைவருக்கும் இனிய மாலை வணக்கம் ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ஐ புட் ஃபோர்த் மை சின்சியர் தேங்க்ஸ் டு அவர் மேனேஜ்மெண்ட் ஆஃப் கலசலிங்கம் குரூப் ஆஃப் இன்ஸ்டிடியூஷன் ஃபார் அக்செப்டிங் ஹோல் ஹார்ட்டி டு கண்டக்ட் திஸ் ஃபார்ட்டி நைன்த் இன்டர்நேஷனல் விர்ச்சுவல் லேர்னிங் சீரீஸ் வித் பிளஸிங் ஆஃப் அல்மைட்டி அவர் ஃபவுண்டர் வல்லல் தெய்வ திருட்டி கலசலிங்கம் ஐயா அண்ட் வித் சப்போர்ட் ஆஃப் அவர் சேர்மன் இளையவல்லல் டாக்டர் எஸ் ஸ்ரீதரன் சார் இன்டர்நேஷனல் விர்ச்சுவல் லேர்னிங் சீரீஸ் இன் அசோசியேஷன் வித் இந்தியன் பார்மசூட்டிக்கல் அசோசியேஷன் சவுத் தமிழ்நாடு லோக்கல் பிரான்ச் ஹெட் ஆஃபீஸ் அட் அருள்மிகு கலசலிங்கம் காலேஜ் ஆஃப் பார்மசி Uh, I wish to extend my deep appreciation and we are uh, proud to uh, have an eminent personality notorious scientist uh, well known administrator and uh, honorable uh, resource person professor dr david fl jenkins uh, department of nano materials and device university of plymouth uh, united kingdom to grace this occasion uh, we thank you for kindly being the valuable part of this session sir it is a great honor to have uh, with us uh, for this occasion Uh, let me acquaint you with sterling quality of eminent personality who is a brilliant researcher and veteran teacher sir your prestigious presence is a great honor for us and great motivation and inspiration for our entire student community uh, sir we are fully appreciate uh, you for finding the time to be with us uh, in spite of your busy schedule sir most welcome dr david professor dr david sir most welcome sir thank you thank you sir uh, next uh, i welcome all the professor faculty members and my dear enthusiastic students for today's session i hope this session will be a good platform for the uh, students to get a good knowledge all the students uh, will utilize this great opportunity explore uh, themselves i t- trust that every students will put their effort to uplifting the successful career all the very best for all the students once again i welcome you all thank you welcome dr david sir professor dr david sir welcome sir please proceed sir okay thank you i say uh if you was here i'd say good morning but i'd say it's good afternoon i think it's about um 3 3 pm over in tamil nadu um there seems a long time now since i've been to india because of all this these problems um but hopefully 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 that will change but i know things are are not so good in parts of india at the minute um so let's have a look so hopefully uh <coughs> we can uh, forget about that for now and have a look at something a little little different so so this talk is um it's it's really based around some um, sort of the kind of the re- research concepts as much as the the actual topics so just to kind of show, to kind of show sort of uh, students who are setting out maybe beginning their phd or thinking about it how how some sort of good practice to um develop your kind of research kind of processes so so this so this is um, a talk you can see quite a few um sort of co-authors uh, both in the UK and you can see also in India um from IISC Bangalore um they're really frustrated on their bangalores in i think maybe they come out of lockdown today i'm not sure okay so we're going to look at um two two kinds of things some uh, sensors that we've been working on for um 
for detection of neurodegenerative disease. And the, the platform is quite generic. And so we've been um, working um, with um, Dr. Vikram and Dr. Professor Sai Siva Gorti at IOSC on applying these for um, waterborne contaminants. And, um, and we'll see we can also, preventing contaminants means not only are they there, but can we remove them as well? So it's, it's, it's quite a few things we'll, we'll cover. So we'll kind of crack on. Um, I never know what people um, know about some of these, um, these kind of diseases. I guess uh, brain tumours, everybody has heard of. Alzheimer's disease is definitely a um, a disease that's less common in India, but it's definitely where you have a young population. But in the West, with an aging population, Alzheimer's is one of of of, of, a, of a few kind of uh, of these neurodegenerative diseases, which cause real problems. Now, you may say, who who do they cause the problems for? Okay, we we we'll go on to have a look at that in a in a little. Um, Wow. So who, who is the who is the kind of the, the patient in this particular kind of area? We also we look at but essentially because we're looking at this with um, students and research development in mind, we kind of go through a systematic kind of process of uh, developing and validating the, the sort of sensors to work in these particular areas. We'll then go on and see how we can then apply the similar kind of work that we we carry out in this Alzheimer's work on the gliomas. So this so this is a we'll again we'll look at what this is really about later. But but essentially we're trying to find out can we determine if someone has the the um, the onset of a tumor in the brain without the, the current need for invasive surgery. And invasive surgery means that it's already advanced quite significantly. The idea is, like when there's a when the snowball rolls down the hill, it's much easier to stop it at the beginning than when it's got a big mass and it's got a lot of momentum. So we're trying to um, see if we can kind of come up with ways of uh, managing, preventing, um, etc. <laughs> another, another area that we we haven't quite got to do yet but we've made a good start is to um, look at alternative sensor platforms and for me this is very interesting because it fits into the work on on all of the uh, working Alzheimer's on brain tumors it also works on the, um, hopefully in the ideas of a real, real time uh, monitoring of um, heavy metals and pathogens in water so it's quite an interesting platform but quite a lot of people are beginning to explore today. And then we'll go on to look at sort of what we will call disease prevention, i.e. looking at um, what's in the water and how can we remove them. And we're not looking at dirty water. We're here we're looking at water that looks clean, looks safe, and mostly it is safe apart from maybe one thing. And that's the thing we need to find out and remove. So let's make a, a start and look at Alzheimer's disease. Now, I do know people say it could be due to large amounts of turmeric that are consumed, that the Indian diet is has been very good at present, preventing people from developing this disease uh, to the extent that it has in the West. But it's a, but the question is, who is the patient in this particular case? So. <laughs> So how does it affect the person with Alzheimer's? <clears throat> well, because it's a progressive neurodegenerative disease, the person may first of all kind of notice that they may forget things. Now, we all forget things, of course, but there becomes a point where it becomes more significant. Um, and you, and be, But these kind of diseases, they also... They, they kind of they don't manifest themselves in a big change. They manifest themselves a small change, and then you go back to normal. And then you have a small change, and, and eventually those small changes become bigger changes until the, the 
the total situation is the, is the disease itself. So as a person becomes more affected by this, then they start to sign, show more significant signs because it's the, the, the brain's ability to control um, a lot of bodily function starts to um, degenerate. So people have difficulty, say, with swallowing some, some areas of speech. Then it starts to affect, say, their, more their cognitive behaviour. And then it gets into the difficult situations where a couple have been married for 40 years. The husband, for example, has Alzheimer's. His wife says, good morning. And he says, who are you? I don't know you. So, and then it's, it become the challenges. So who is, to become, who is the patient? The person with the disease, um, we often look at, we can only look at from our perspective. But for the person trying to look after them, they now have a person that they've loved all their life. They still love, but they don't recognise them. Their, 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 their body is much more difficult um, to look after. And finally, the, the, brain, the, the brain will shut down. And, um, and then we have to kind of think, OK, what can we learn? What can we do? <laughs> so these are these are definitely difficult um, diseases to, uh, to detect. So it's not as simple as it is once, once the disease is, um, displays symptoms. So the problem is, how can we find if there is something in the blood that says this, this nasty disease is on its way? So, so, so we have like one problem is this identifying biomarkers. Now, this this is this is maybe the most challenging part of um, of this um, research, and um, th this research in Alzheimer's is part of a um, of a large project, it's a Marie Curie project with uh, around fourteen PhD PhD students around. They're based in Europe, but they come from uh, all over the world. Um, in, in, in Plymouth, um, we have um, Jagriti Sethi. She comes from Delhi. She did her MTech at um, uh, Amity Noida, which I managed to visit. And um, she, she certainly left an impression with them. So people from everywhere. So we're trying to identify the suitable sensor technology. This is again, it's a challenging thing because we're moving into areas where the materials become very interesting, but they come with so many challenges. <clears throat> so we have to kind of explore um, a number of sensor platforms, develop the technology, and then apply it to the, the biomarkers. And hopefully, we can get to a point where people will be able to have this kind of lab on a chip that, that people talk so much about, and it has been developed in, in many cases, but we're now looking to expand the platform to, to this, um, this kind of exciting area. Because um, as I said, it leads on to like, who is, the, who is the patient? And as you can see, we can identify these, um, we can identify, detect biomarkers, then the big thing it puts an, a big burden on healthcare because uh, because this is a can be a massive part. The person looking after the person no longer can work; they become the carer. So life becomes very very challenging. So <clears throat> as I said, there's been a, a a big part of this this uh, this project, as you can see. Has been exploring massive data sets using using different um, sort of ideas, uh, data mining, deep learning, the AI, trying to identify sort of markers that we can explore, and then some have have been have arisen, and and some are already around, which are, which are useful for us to develop the sensors. Around, but we're not going to be focusing on develop the detection, the sorry, the um, identification of the biomarkers, but the the way that we can actually 
develop a platform in a in a nice uh, logical way. So so we started off with essentially a, a relatively simple platform, <clears throat> and this used uses a commercially available um, sensor, which we're going to be um, we need to actually make these ourselves now. We're using um, different materials um, on and create different devices. But again, we're, we're completely um, locked out of our lab at the minute. So we can't progress in this. But, but this is the kind of sensor that's been used. And, and it's based around ele electrochemical um, sensing. So this was the first um, sensor that we kind of um, got to play with here. And as you can see, the, the idea is, is to um, understand this kind of relationship between, say, the current and the voltage under different configurations. <clears throat> and the idea here is to just to try and see what parameters will uh, change the response of this system. So, so, so it, we've often used in the electrodes either graphene oxide um, reduce graphene oxide or even graphene. So I hope everyone is familiar with graphene, that this nice hexagonal close pack structure, a, a mono layer, it can be several layers, which are layers on top of each other, not just a thick film. Um, then we have, for those who are not so familiar, graphene oxide, essentially, it's just, it looks just like, if you had a monolayer of graphene oxide, it looks just like graphene, but it has functional groups attached. So you get epoxy, hydroxyl, and carboxyl groups. And we'll see, we'll see, can see later how that if we actually um, apply a reduction process, which can be electrochemical or, th or photothermal, then we can actually liberate many of these functional groups and we end up with a, with a material that has some groups and maybe some defects in the structure. And this is this becomes known as uh, RGO. But in this case here, we're just starting here with um, GO. Remember, GO is, is, a, is not a conductor, whereas RGO and graphene are excellent conductors. So, so this one here is, you can see here how this has been characterized with different uh, concentrations of, of graphene oxide in the electrodes. <laughs> and in here, you can see we develop a systematic um, approach. And you can see this is the, the kind of basis. So what happens the next stage, we then move on to further um, explore the parameters which will um, change the response that we get from this cyclic voltammetry analysis. <clears throat> we'll see that there are there are other ways that we can operate these sensors, but in in this particular case, it's just um, current versus voltage in this simple form, and you can see here that on the on the left, we've um, shown how the response changes with our according to uh, four different electrode materials, RGO, graphene, RGO, graphene, and then geo graphene. <coughs> so again, this is nice and systematic, <coughs> and we can see how the, the RGO graphene is the, is the most sensitive um, surface in this particular case. <coughs> okay, so like, like in many uh, sensor situations, how you operate them, also has an impact and in this case here you can see how um, we can change the response by changing the scan rate remember in all these you can't just keep on increasing and increasing and increasing so we can see that we can we've increased here but if we do keep on increasing we'll find that that we'll start to lose you, you can never keep winning and winning and winning so so we so we kind of seen how um, we can develop these sensors and, um, and then we need to try and kind of apply them to a, um, a particular situation. So here we've now um, using the same, the same kind of sensors, but we're using a, a slightly different configuration. So it's still electrochemical, but we're now using differential pulse voltammetry. 
And um, and you can see here that in the detection results that um, this particular um, device structure and now has a detection limit of about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13 molar, which is uh, to a degree better than at the north of the um, uh, detection limits which have been reported elsewhere. So, so this gives us um, a lot of uh, confidence. So now we can apply this more directly in the area of, um, of Alzheimer's. So, so clustering has been identified as um, a useful um, biomarker in, in the development of um, uh, Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> and you can see here that um, we were interested in two particular issues here. Um, one is the sensitivity and also the, the linearity. So how does this, how does, does this, these kinds of sensors detect clustering? We'll look, we'll look at this a little bit more deeply later on, but essentially we have to um, form on the surface this kind of uh, antibody antigen um, sensor configuration, <clears throat> as you can see here, and um, and with this particular sensor, we we've been able to go down to around one picogram per milliliter with a with a good linear uh, range of one to one hundred picograms per milliliter. So bear in mind this 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 kind of number of one picogram per milliliter. Although you, we we will find it in some of the other research that has been reported, we we change a, to a different kind of uh, units. But but when we look on the um, SIRS later on, the, this one picogram per milliliter will be quite an important um, consideration. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> so cyclic voltammetry is a is a useful um, tool, and um, and we're still working on in this particular area. As we'll see some of the results that Jagriti has has recently published. But um, some of the based around someone who was one of the postdocs working within our group, and now um, a couple of PhD students, they're trying to do the similar kind of detection using um, the graphene field effect transistor or GFET. And um, again, we have us. There are some similarities with um, the um, the work that, that we just um, looked at. But this case here, now it's the same pro process of can we develop this sensor platform using, um, say, known. Um, um, Sort of biomarkers. <laughs> so this, in this case, we're not looking at a biomarker for for Alzheimer's, but we're looking to um, detect HCG. <clears throat> and um, and you can see, you can see here, it, this is a, it's a similar kind of configuration where we essentially we form our detection channel, which is this graphene layer, and essentially we have to modify it such that we can we can de detect changes in the, um, say, the electrical characteristics of this GFET according to this uh, HCG binding event. <clears throat> and so, so we need to develop the GFET um, technology. So this, became, this, this became much more of a challenge compared to um, the electrochemical, electrochemical, we we were able, we were, at the time we would buy in from drop sense um, sensors, and we could choose different electro configurations. We can also modify them, but when it came to the GFETs, then this all had to be done within our clean room. Um, so I'm not sure how much people know about graphene. Um, every, everyone that has probably heard of it. But it's a very, very difficult uh, material to work with. Um, to give you a clue as to the difficulty of, of working with graphene, Professor 
um, Ferrari at Cambridge and Cambridge Graphene Centre. He, he kind of uh, has an idea that from the, the kind of the, the early days of graphene in 2004, it could be 40 years before we, we work with graphene in the same way that we work with silicon. Um, and that, as you know, silicon now, you would say it's a commercial technology. Pe people um, may micro machine silicon, but people buy silicon wafers. No, no, universities don't make them. And uh, similarly with graphene, it's, um, it has become largely a, um, a commercial um, process. It's a it's, um, difficult material to make, and at the minute it can only be made um, grown on copper. And as you can see, this, this is the kind of the starting point. And if you want to get, uh, sorry, if you wish to get graphene onto your um, silicon, silicon dioxide substrate, then we have to go through a, a number of processes. So the, the first one would be um, to cope with the polymer, PMMA. <clears throat> and then we have to say so it's a sacrificial process where we have to essentially lose the bottom layer of the graphene. We have to use the, lose the copper. And then we have to then remove the PMMA. Um, and as you can see from these kind of processes, we, we end up in a, at a point where we're at uh, E, where we have um, our kind of um, graphene monolayer with the PMMA polymer on top. And um, the, the normal process has been to use acetone as a solvent. Um, the graphene bonds well to the silicon. So we, the idea is you, you wash the, the uh, PMMA with um, acetone. But unfortunately, that doesn't actually work well enough it doesn't remove everything and so we end up with problems when we we look at the electro the electrical characteristics of the of the structure and so the technique that we developed was to um was to expose the pmma to uh 254 nanometers deep uv uvc and again you can't do this for one minute 20 minutes or three hours you have to find the optimum time, and we found that around 20 minutes exposure to, to this um, wavelength was um, able to um, allow the, the bond, the dangly bonds to kind of weaken. And so when we then applied the acetone wash, we found that we, we pretty well removed all of the um, PMMA. Uh, but for now, don't think that's now solved all the issues it solved this issue okay so <clears throat> what does this mean it means that we can kind of uh, again characterize this these these devices and you can see <clears throat> the um on the on the left hand side uh, kind of a so this is just a con conventional kind of photoresist lift off process on graphene and and on, and then we have the other process using a deep UV, and you can see now that um, looking at the Raman signals, so, and not just the fact that. But if you can see the um, on A, the signal, the Raman signal is quite quite noisy. And on B, it's this is not the case. But you have to. But it's also important to look at the scale to see the um, the intensity, which is a measure of the signal. Is that is the is the counts. So without deep UV, we 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 go up to around a thousand counts, whereas we go to twelve thousand um, using the deep UV treatment. We also remember Raman is a, is a point measurement. But if we map it, we can see. So we're, what we're looking for here is to have a, a fairly um, homo homogeneous map of the surface. And that you can see this is what we uh, we've been able to achieve. And then we also um, validate this further using AFM. So 
so we you can see there's an optical image on the on the on the top <clears throat> and you can see the line scan of the afm shows that that you can see the the actual um, residue on the surface which has now been largely removed by the deep uv process <clears throat> and so we can then go on to apply all of these processes now to to create this um this this channel so it's so you can see now the we're looking at the gate within the device the source and the drain um are formed by um, evaporating chrome onto the onto the um silicon silicon dioxide and then we sputter gold onto the chrome to create the source and the drain <coughs> and uh and the working electrode is is the graphene channel as you can see <coughs> and again we have to go okay, so how 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 does this um this sensor um work in terms of how does it perform as we again we we go through this process of um trying to validate it and understand it and so obviously the what, what happens when you've got nothing just a bare bare device so this gives us a reference um response as you can see and then on the right on b we now um are exploring what actually happens under different um concentrations and you can see here for the hcg as you can see concentrations are like one picogram to 100 nanograms per, per milliliter <clears throat> so so this so we in these devices we're looking at the like the, res, the resistance of or resistivity resistance of the channel and so <clears throat> again you can see on the left hand side you can see how this how this sensor evolves as we go through from the the start the base as we introduce the linker and then we have the an antibody we have the BAS, bsa which is the the blocker to to um limit limit any interactions outside of the the um the antibodies and then you can see finally what happens with the hcg and again we on the right hand side you can see that we, we're down to this sort of one one picogram per milliliter which seems to be um wh where we're kind of plateauing at the minute so we now have to work out what can we do and at the minute i don't have the answers for where how do we go beyond this at the minute but there will be some there will be a, a way i hope okay so this is all part of a project um called bb dag and you can see there's jagriti um she's been working on this now for two and a half years and she's sort of currently now trying to look at winding up her research and trying to write up she's um oh hold on. <coughs> this this is some of her she's recently published this um this paper on this sort of label free biosensor based on graphene graphene reduced graphene oxide and again you can see again it's it's a number it's systematic development of the of the um electro of the sensor in this case here it was playing around with um adding an additional factor this is going from a macro electrode to a micro electrode and again this 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 gave us a uh, an improvement from 10 picograms down to this sort of one picogram per milliliter for h hcg <laughs> to sort of um and you can see now some of the uh, cyclic voltammetry results <clears throat> and fin finally we come up with a means of trying to give a a kind of degree of um <coughs> of a performance measure of this so <clears throat> and as you can see that the results take us down into the sort of very low concentrations but but importantly we have this nice linear um response and maybe this is the area one area where maybe now further signal processing may take us a little bit further 
as quite often the case, a physical system can often go an order of magnitude further with with um, suitable um, uh, sort of software tools applied. <clears throat> so, so this is where we got to so far in this particular area. <laughs> so, in, in parallel with this, we have um, a project, another project started. Um, so, this is about uh, a year and a half old now. So, we're, we're about halfway through. And again, it's um, 14, 14 students all around um, Europe. I, I know there's, there's uh, definitely one student from India I met in Italy working on this. Mina, who's working on this, she comes from Iran. Um, and uh, so she's working really hard and really keen to get back into the lab. So, so, so what this is about is essentially these gliomas, a, a type of brain tumour. And um, so they're, like many tumours, they're, they're aggressive, fast growing. And remember, with, with tumours, you really have to stop them before they have any chance to, to get going. And, um, and at the minute, if you have any symptoms, and typically these could be severe headaches, for example, is, is one common area where people may show some signs. You then have to have like biopsies and you say um, various, um, even though they're not invasive physically, they're quite personally invasive to so have CT scans, MRI, etc. And um, so we got a, a number of projects within this overall project looking at um, detection mechanisms. Again, again, we can apply these into all of the other areas that we are working in. <clears throat> so, and so these are the, the particular cells that we're, we're trying to um, identify the presence of, and we're trying to identify, well, or maybe not the presence of, but the, the, the potential presence of them. So are they going to be formed within the, the structure of a person's brain. Again, the same big, big problem, um, biomarkers. And again, one of, one, uh, one of the, one of the uh, PhD students is based in Plymouth in a medical school uh, working on um, in this particular area um, and, uh, to try and identify these um, either biomarkers, so we're looking at biomarkers. In this particular case, Mina is actually look, looking for something slightly different. So it's rather than looking for this, um, so this particular biomarker in the way that we had looked at before, Mina is trying to identify um, DNA methylation. And, um, and for this particular um, case, Within the, the project itself, there's three other techniques which people have been using. But Mina's been working on electrochemicals, so there are the GFETs. There's a group in Belgium, I think, working on digital ELISA. Group in Italy are working on plasmonics. And in Plymouth, we're working on um, electrochemical. And um, similar, similar kind of... Um, methods are being, being applied here. Uh, Mina doesn't want me to share her results just yet because she's just writing a paper. So hopefully that paper will be ready soon for um, submission. And then we can tell you a little bit more about what she's found. But uh, again, it's using this, it's a very similar because these are kind of generic um, sensors. But the, the interesting one for me at the minute is, um, is this kind of surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. Um, it's, it's become a tool that's quite fascinated me, um, not only in these, these particular bio areas, but I've also developed a little bit of an interest in um, nanoplastics as opposed to microplastics. So for all of you um, sort of biologists and sort of bio-aware people, nanoplastics are, are are very interesting to detect because these actually um, are disruptive on the cellular level. 
And so um, unlike microplastics where we don't totally know the, the, um, the actual outcome of microplastics within aquatic species and then ultimately with, 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 with man or woman, um, we do know that um, nanoplastics and, and nanoparticles have to be treated with great care. And so we would, and, and SERS is maybe the best technique to detect them. So why is, why is, why is SERS so important? It's one reason is because the, the Raman signal is very weak, as you saw with our um, earlier data, when the sample wasn't very good, the signal was very weak, it wasn't, it wasn't such a, a useful way to work. Um, this is because uh, the, the Raman signal, which is either, either classified as a Stokes or anti-Stokes scattering, is, is something like 10 to the 6 times less than the, the elastic signal that would normally would dominate. And obviously this is filtered out. But with SIRS, we, we take advantage of um, plasmonics to enhance because this is about the electric field that interacts with the with the vibrating molecules, with plasmonics, we're able to actually enhance the, the electric field due to um, due to something like evanescent waves, <laughs> which are which happen when light is incident at a certain angle. And with spherical objects, then we can always satisfy that criteria. And if we get the, the, the particles we have said to form the surface, we'll see we have, um, say, particles on the surface. And if they get quite close together, then we can get these kind of hot spots where we can even get a greater enhancement. And we can also get some um, some uh, electrochemical enhancement. So, and the good thing is we can use a, a SERS chip in a conventional Raman system. And so... You may think, okay, that's quite easy, but these these devices are hard to make. And so this is work I've started with um, Bing Lee. He was he was he did his PhD at Plymouth. He's now um, he's now a um, research fellow at Imperial in, in uh, working on various kind of uh, medical and biomedical applications. And so so we're trying to fabricate these devices and I do have two of these in my drawer in my office but I can't do anything with them at the minute um, so the idea is to kind of again it's sort of a, we have to use sort of um, various kind of electron beam lithography to form these kinds of structures and then we have to coat them with gold so essentially we're getting these little um, gold spheres on the surface and with them being close together we can get um, significant um enhancement but what's so great for me about these is that for example with dna methylation we can have samples of methylated and unmethylated or non-methylated and detect them at the same time so <clears throat> so this has a lot of implications for uh the work that mina's been doing but it also has lots of um, potential for the work that we're doing in Bangalore on um, on water quality, where it looks as though we could develop a portable tool or um, a system that can be plumbed into to uh, for real time monitoring um, when 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 if, uh, when binding events occur, we'll 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 see changes in Raman signal, but we can also then flush the surface with a, a change of pH and water, and we can then use this, keep using this um, this uh, sensor chip continuously, maybe not forever, but for a long, long time. So this kind of takes us on to our last, just being invaded by my pussy cat. So, so this takes us on to this kind of area of, we call disease prevention. Um, again, this has been um, become a massive part of my um, research and personal life i think as um as i got into say water quality so i'm, I'm quite i'm quite heavily involved in the india uk water center um i'll send a link later we have a 
um, a webinar, um, I think it's the 4th of August, if I'm correct. And we're trying to look at the, the issues of um, water within the COVID-19 pandemic. And I know that I've been looking at uh, this recently in, in, in rural India, where so where the, the water issues and COVID-19 and how we kind of manage it have become quite an um, integrated issue. So, so to give you, so why is this? So what do we see here? So on the left, we can see, I'd say this is a lovely chalk stream in, 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 in lovely southern England. And it ticks every box that you require in terms of water and the environment. So that, that river is full of um, fish. The water will be clear. It will be low on contaminants. What we also know is that all the all the vegetation around the river, within the river, are helping to clean the environment. And and the fact is that just looks healthy. Whereas um, in Tamil Nadu, in Chennai, you can see this one here. This is um, this is in Tinagar, which I took um, a couple of years ago. Um, well, I'll, I'll let you 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 comment on that. I won't, but you can see it's not quite right, is it? Um, and this is a river possibly was a source of drinking water fifty years ago. So, so we're, we we want to go from the right to the left, um, and we do know that there are within the rivers lots of um, problems. Um, and yes, there are water treatment plants in India, but not like we have in the UK, and certainly not as many. In the UK, we are maybe, we could be global leaders in this particular area. So the idea, so what we're looking at is what people do within their homes, within industry, etc. This wastewater, and sadly in India, if this was industry, it just goes straight into the river and it shouldn't, but people are, are hiding pipes and pumping it into the Ganges. I've seen all of this from LIDAR, from uh, IIT Kanpur, and it's absolutely atrocious. But often in, in, in domestic situations, this will literally will go straight back into the river. Okay, but what we want is a situation like we have in the UK, um the microplastics come into this area we're trying to sort this one out but you can see here there's a a much it's a, it's a fairly sophisticated process and this is only to turn water into a safe form to go into rivers seas to be a source of um surface water and groundwater now if I if I go to anyone's home in England and they say, "Do you would you like a glass of water?" I might say yes or no, depending if I'm thirsty or not. Whereas I know in India, I have to say, I have to ask about its source because I know that, for example, this particular processing is not happening. So the water that actually goes into here is already pretty good, but it then goes through. It's quite a sophisticated um, process system, as you can see, that um, yields um, water, which is just totally safe to drink. It does produce some areas of, um, I wouldn't say concern, but um, it certainly does raise some questions about the sludge. The sludge is used for fertilizers and people sometimes comment on it a little bit smelly, but it should be safe in terms of the environment. It also is a means of producing um, and methane as well can also produce. <clears throat> so that's the situation we've got. And we're kind of interested in, again, the same kinds of sensors, but developing a different kind of strategy um so so we we know in metals are often uh, uh geographical or industrial in nature 
So in the UK, we have the same. In, in southwest England, we have, we've had with water that would be contaminated from um, arsenic, from, from mining. Uh, but we know, I know in India, there are problems of, um, say, can, copper, cadmium, lead, nickel, chromium, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some of them are geographical. Some of them, I know in, in Chennai, chromium from leather industries is a, is a problem. And also the, diff, the pathogens. And of course, now we, we have no idea where um, um, SARS, SARS-CoV-2 comes into this. That's the, the novel coronavirus. We do not, this is totally unknown as to whether this is something we have to consider here. But we do know that this causes a lot of uh, infant mortality. I know things are getting better, but there's still a, lot, a long way to go. So, so we're interested to come up with this kind of, um, again, all, all low cost. So uh, developing a kind of, um, say, GFET devices. Um, and we, Although we say they're using graphene, it will be related materials because the problem with graphene is that it, it oxidizes very quickly. And so we're looking to develop um, not only um, hermetically sealed systems, but ones using maybe RGO or maybe some other 2D materials that, that have a kind of a, a longevity, whereas a lifetime of a graphic, exposed graphene GFET is about 20 minutes before you have to um, think about what to do next. So we're trying to develop an array of these um, these um, sensors to detect maybe six metal, six pathogens. Um, now, I should have updated this slide because we are no longer working with Next Big Lab. Uh, we're actually doing all of this in, in, um, in Bangalore, where we will be once we're back in again. Um, so, in, so in Bangalore, we've um, we've already working with um, Smile, the spin-out company of SciSiva, Gorty, and um, so we developed our own 3D bioprinter, and we're looking to kind of to come up with a system again to uh, for, so that's a detection system, and then um, the group there has a lot of experience and published a lot in this area of microfluidic um, devices. <clears throat> but ultimately, what we want to try and do is to come up with something like this, where we can have our um, sort of sensor to uh, detect um, contaminants. But the, the key here is, OK, so these contaminants, especially if they're pathogens, are, are definitely migratory and transient. And uh, we'd like to be able to use a phone and say so if you go to a village there could be a, a bore well you pump the water and every week or every month we we measure the water what's what's in it send it to a server and we want to produce a map of these contaminants to so try and understand what's going on and this will be a totally um free open source um uh, website that anyone can use globally to see what's going on <laughs> okay moving moving sort of swiftly onto this onto the kind of the, the last part of this i hope we haven't gone too long but uh, i do talk a lot sometimes um how can we remove these um air, how can we remove these contaminants so so we again we've um the working bangle or with metals focused on lead we're now working on uh, e coli um but the, the work on filtration has also been around lead. Um, and, and the idea was initially to develop um, membranes. A group in Manchester was tried, lots of groups tried. Um, but we kind of could never get our head around the fact that we had a limited kind of volume that we could work with in that kind of configuration. So, so Jonathan Bloor is, again, he's, also, he's starting to write up his PhD in a minute. He developed um, these very user-friendly um, materials. So they're biocompatible, biodegradable. They're made from graphene oxide and seaweed. Essentially, they're all space. So within, so within a small volume, we have an enormous surface in which we can actually um, adsorb contaminants and, and um, the, the, the process is, uh, is charge. So, 
So the pores are very large compared to what's passing through. But the idea is as the, as the water with, for example, lead passes through, the lead gets adsorbed onto the surface throughout the structure. Um, it's quite um these these materials are quite adaptable, and again, this is some work that we've kind of been doing with Bangalore as well. Is developing, playing around with these, so we can make these these gels to be hydrophilic, hydrophobic, um, olefilic, and oleophobic. So lots of potential here for the work on the nanoplastic filtration. But um, if you if you if I can play this video, you'll see, I hope, you're going to play. So you can see here, we've got this uh, dyed rapeseed oil mixed with water. And, uh, and an aerogel is just between two tubes. And as it passes, so now we pour it in. And what we'll see is that that mixture is not only separated in the sense that uh, oil and water often does separate. In this case here, it's separated via this. Um, it, only the water is allowed to pass through. So the 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 the, the aerogel is in um, hydrophilic. So it, so it doesn't like the the oil, but it likes the so the water will go through and the oil will stay um i'm not sure if the water if, if johnny ever drunk this water but it should be safe anyway it's only um, rapeseed oil with with a small amount of um safe dye <laughs> so <clears throat> so we can sort of move on to the kind of the next <laughs> okay so <clears throat> another another issue in in, in the water that the term is um uh, that could be available for consumption is is obviously dyes as well. So we can also um, use these gels to remove um, methylene blue in this case. And again, we can see we can re we can remove these uh, this dye quite well. And if we know that if we put a, um, a an aerogel into a solution with methylene blue, ultimately you'll see that that gel will be full of dye and the water will be totally clear so then we go on to again it's systematic development um again lockdown has put us in a position where we can't take this to the next stage so this is um looking at um water um lead in water so again johnny's played around with very very high concentrations way above um the, the kind of requirements for the for um drinking water, but we wanted to see how, how much it could remove, how much it, what the capacity was. And they also know that we can also regenerate them. And you can see here, so this is a long time. This is two hours, but you have to look at this area here. So this is the, so this is the area where we're really interested. What happens in, in moments, in a very short period of time with a very low concentration. So the idea is a gel like this could go into a, into a, either within a pump system or even in bottles. So you, you have it um, a little filter in a cap. So when you when you drink, the water will just pass through the aerogel, removing the contaminants. And again, it shows a very, very high absorption capacity. So these filters can work a long, long time. Um, afterwards, they can either be regenerated or incinerated. And, but they're also very, the idea is very, very low cost. <coughs> okay, and um, another thing. So all these these materials all come on to different kinds of uh, other applications. So what happens if we configure this aerogel such that we can apply um, a very um, small electric field? Or maybe, it may, may, maybe the electric field may be quite high, but the voltage required is quite low. And, and we know that with this particular configuration, then we can actually pass uh, brackish water, not sea water, but very lightly um, salinated water into an aerogel. And again, we can, um, 
we can actually remove the the irons and the the water that comes out is then safe for for drinking so low voltage means we can do this with solar it's much cheaper than reverse osmosis so lots and lots of kind of uh potential and i know there's a group there's a group at um and Rita in Chennai, which are working on on these particular um, devices as well. And again, we're looking at, again from for nanoplastic. So, <clears throat> okay, just a little summary. Then um, we've 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 hopefully we've shown uh, a systematic approach to developing um, electrochemical and GFET sensors. Um, we know that the, in the bigger picture of this work, the biomarker detection and identification is key. But we do know that so far we, we can get very high detection sensitivity. So ultimately, with, with the right biomarkers, a small droplet of blood dropped onto the device allowed to, to drive will be a point of source diagnostics and hopefully something which will improve quality of life that's the main thing if we can improve make things better make a difference then it's good um we may find that SIRS is a is a is another tool but that will be a more expensive platform whereas the the other sensors are de designed around low cost we look we can apply the again our material development to to make these aerogels so we see lots of applications, removal of metals, pathogens, dyes, and for desalination. Now, if you want to know a little bit more about um, not just the work we do in Plymouth, but um, the, the work that uh, my colleagues are doing, we, there's a, a recent um, article. I think it's I think it's available uh, in August for for. Um, so, so, so this is a review article that looks at um, essentially graphene-based systems for the detection of neurodegenerative biomarkers. Um, we have another another paper in preparation, and also a book chapter should follow soon. So, lots of lots of things will be available soon to hopefully whet your appetite. And and um, but I say this is this is a teamwork. So um, couldn't really done any of this without a massive team. So you can see, so a lot of my, say, Genoa Pan, Cameron Islam, he's now, he was the guy who began the work on the GFETs. Lots of CC colleagues from um, UK, India, China. It's a, big, it's a big team and say, you can't work on your own these days. You need, need to work as a team work globally, work internationally, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll make some progress. So uh, I just find it to say uh, thank you very much. And I hope that wasn't too long. <laughs> thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor David, sir. Thank you, sir. So I hope that was okay. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Doctor. We had a wonderful and informative presentation, Doctor. Yeah, so, uh, Professor, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll any can questions? Share, I can share the PowerPoint with you. Okay. Questions? Any questions? This is where everyone goes quiet. <laughs> Any question? Any question? But if anyone wishes to, to uh, ask me any questions by email, just my email is there. Just contact me. Um, I, I, I know often people get shy. <laughs> asking questions. And there's no, no, there's no such thing as a silly question. Okay. If you don't, if something's not clear ask don't, don't keep wondering yeah. <laughs> 
हेलो इस बार ये नहीं चार बार क्वेश्चन सर पदन अंगुल सर सर इस बार ये नहीं नो नो क्वेश्चन सर ओके आई सर ओके 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 डॉक्टर डेविड सर वेरी काइंड ऑफ योर प्रेजेंटेशन ओके आई थैंक यू थैंक यू Uh, on behalf of our management of uh, Kalasalingam College of Pharmacy, hereby express my whole hearted thanks to you and your university for giving such an informative and wonderful presentation, uh, Professor Dr. David. Yes, I hopefully. Yeah, I hope this interaction will motivate the students and encourage. Sorry, hopefully I can visit. When when is the mean active learning really? Yeah. Uh, Doctor David sir, uh, Professor Professor Doctor David sir. Yes. Yeah. In future also let's have a good collaboration for the development of our students' career, uh, David sir. Of course, yeah. Thank you, thank you, yeah. Doctor. Anyone can contact me. Um, thank you. Another one more request, uh, Doctor uh, David sir. Another one more request. Yes. Kindly refer your colleague or friends for our future webinar, international webinar session. Okay. Kindly, kindly refer for our future webinar, future webinar. Okay. I can now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay then. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Have a have a good day. Bye 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 take care take care yeah okay and you bye 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 bye